All right, uh, hello everyone. Uh, welcome back to another episode of Ushanka Show Live. We're trying to catch up with 109,000. I think it's where we're at right now. Double check here really quick. We are almost 110, I think, right? So I see some people join. Please uh, <clears throat> verify that um, the sound is okay. It's always I want to make sure that microphone works. Yeah, we need another 401 subscriber to get 110,000. So it's kind of awesome. And we got first question from Craig. Uh, have you watched the TV show The Americans? No, I did not. Uh, for some reason, I just have a zero interest to watch Americans pretending to be Russian spies. Uh, just, I don't know. It just, uh, I considered watching it several times and just for some reason, uh, no interest whatsoever. I would mind to rewatch uh, Chernobyl again. That's on my list. Uh, I generally don't like to watch TV series, TV shows. You know, I would mind to watch a movie once in a while, but if it's like, you know, extended series, I'm extremely picky. Uh, you know, I uh, Queen's Gambit, I like that a lot. I watch that. I want to watch it again. I said Chernobyl, otherwise, no. No, the Americans. So... Sound is good, so uh, great. Uh, so anyway, so if you guys have any questions, uh, just please, you know what to do. If you want to support this live, there's a little uh, super chat uh, button. You can throw some money at me. It always works. Um, my next project I'm planning to do <clears throat> is uh, make a video about Soviet birthdays. Somehow I missed that topic and someone just posted a question, so I'll be answering that. And we got some people joining, so thank you so much. Maybe we'll get to 100 people. Um, we'll see. Uh, the next question, do you have name days in the USSR? Uh, name days. So like Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, if you're asking that. So of course, понедельник, вторник, среда, четверг, пятница, суббота и воскресенье. The only difference in the week so we start a week on Monday. In America, for some reason, week begins on Sunday. Uh, so it's kind of always confusing. So, you know, we have a week goes, Sunday wraps it up, and next week starts on Monday. Uh, we had no terminologies. One thing, um, you know, when you live in another country, even your language is maybe okay, uh, several topics can throw you off or uh, sayings. So I, I couldn't understand what the hump day means. Uh, periodically, I see on Instagram there'll be a picture, and uh, sometimes um, some girl will be showing her humps and say "Happy Hump Day." So I had a, uh, some idea. So on Wednesday, it's like it's supposed to be, you know, for boyfriends, girlfriends, or married couple. It's the humping day, <laughs> but I didn't realize it means you over the hump and you go towards the weekend. So that was kind of weird thing. I for a long time couldn't understand what that means. And while we're on the topic of misunderstanding, there's another thing. Just like when you're a foreigner, you can run in all kind of, hopefully not troubles, but I could understand for a long time what seasoned hardwood means. For me, seasoning is something you add to the food. So when I see seasoning, seasoned hardwood for sale, I was like, man, this crazy Americans, they already come up with the idea to sell a, you know, firewood that has some kind of spices. So it maybe smells like barbecue or ranch. So it, I never knew that seasoned, I mean, for a long time now I know that it meant uh, <laughs> that you uh, keep the over season to have a dry, so it's a dry hardwood. Well, it looks like there are some people that first time uh, managed to catch the live. That's awesome. Uh, <clears throat> and also, if you really, you know, please let us know where you guys are from. I always like to see. Uh, the locations so usually you know 60 of my viewers are from the united states but we have some uh far away distant countries i haven't seen their postcards recently i collect postcards from all over the world uh recently that kind of uh, was a uh, trickle and then it's uh, stopped so if uh, um, i have an address on every my uh youtube video there's a link it's a p.o box 96 in Bering springs so uh, i'll be more than happy to get a postcard from you and actually 
This is one of the presents from one of my viewers, a simple workout to defeat communism. I got, uh, let's see, what else we got question? So the question, how different is the Kursk region uh, to Ukraine? I don't think it's a lot of a different. It's pretty close to the border, so it's a lot of similarity. And back in the day, uh, there was a lot of Ukrainian people living on that side, Ukrainian-speaking people. Uh, so I never traveled there, but I was saw in the videos when Ukraine uh, went into Kursk region. I didn't see a lot of difference, really. Uh, Roads look a little bit better, at least at that uh, Suja uh, local, uh, like regional center, right? Center roads were better. Yeah, so supposedly Russia has more money to fix roads, but I'm not uh, sure. So I, I don't think it's a big difference climate wise. It's also northern part, so they mostly grow potatoes, wheat, uh, nothing impressive. And we got the first donation, $5. So let me do, let's see, one. Two, three, four. All right. So we got five bucks. Uh, we're starting math today on the first donation. Uh, see, James, thank you so much. You always support my work. I appreciate that. Uh, do you think Soviet style prefabricated mass produced apartments could help solve the housing crisis in America today? Well, they tried to solve the crisis building those so called projects in Chicago and uh, New York and uh, other large cities, and it failed uh, dramatically. It's not a, about how cheaply you build housing. is pretty much what how people uh, behave in those apartments. And that's, I was thinking about, I probably should make a video on this topic, especially like I, I posted today, a video about uh, Soviet housing. You see, for the Soviet people, uh, living in apartments was like, this is the best option you can get. If you live in your own house, that means you pretty much uh, rough in it, right? You have no running water, no plumbing, no running hot water. Uh, so in order to get an apartment would be awesome. So basically, you know, it's like premium housing. Uh, so we did have periodically uh, alcoholics, you know, some other people that have problems when they, when they have drug addicts, at least I uh, don't know anyone like that. So if you have a little bit of these people sprinkled uh, in apartment buildings, they don't do a lot of damage. But if you pile like in America, like Chicago, famous uh, Cabrini Green apartment complex, if you put all the poor people, just it's, you concentrate them in one apartment building, then you have a lot of troubles. So it's not about cheaply building housing it's about how to, i don't know how to handle the problem that a lot of poor people you know they're poor for the reason like they just cannot i don't know how to explain that you know i came to america with 50 dollars in my pocket and i never lived on the streets you know i always worked and if i could get two jobs i picked up two jobs uh, it's just that some people they just can't handle a life and if you provide them with additional help, they just don't care. I don't know how to explain it. You know, we had, um, like, in our, in our apartment building, our neighbors across next to us, uh, the guy was a hardcore alcoholic, and his wife was constantly borrowing money from my mom uh, to make to the next uh, paycheck, let's put it that way. We didn't have checks. Uh, so I don't think uh, cheap housing, building cheap housing will fix the problem. It's, it's basically how to deal with the right, do the right mix. But you know, people who can afford their own house that don't want to live in those apartments, you know, in America, it's the opposite way. A lot of things, you know, it's totally backwards. Uh, if you compare Soviet Union and the United States, you know, our waitresses and waiters were making a killing, like same, same as the taxi drivers in America, it's the like lowest paid jobs. Um, so I don't think the cheap mass-produced housing will fix the problem. It's how to, <clears throat> I don't know, how to figure out the human situation. A uh, long time ago, there was an article in the Wall Street Journal on this topic that they brought um, a lot of immigrants in some town in New York. and But they weren't like Eastern Europe, not uh, from the Soviet Union. And they placed them, they were refugees, so maybe like Yugoslavia, right? Croatians or somebody, or Serbians. And they put them in an apartment building. And then they see that people 
take care of the apartment. They, you know, put place flowers. They don't put the graffitis. Uh, you know, they maintain us. They're like, well, I guess we'll fix it, make it look even better. And then, of course, neighboring apartment building, which had mostly um, African Americans, they got all mad because how come you don't fix our apartment? We got graffiti all over. And you start fixing it like these people take care of their apartment building. So, you know, we want to make it even better. So it's complicated. But you need to understand for the Soviet people living in an apartment was that's the best you can get. That's the, you know, when my parents finally got the three room cooperative apartment, that was like dreams come true. I had my own room. This is like, wow. All right. So. Let's see. Uh, the question about days you were named after, like you were named after some saint or something. Well, my name is apparently originally comes from uh, ancient Rome. It was one of the Roman like family names and it's went through, you know, it's in every language. You got Sergio, you got Sergio, Sergei. Um, a lot of our names, it's like they go from old Slavic traditions or can think of any like you honestly don't know much about the names. Uh, question, have you ever uh, listened to Pavlo Zibrov? Name sounds familiar. Maybe it's like what the uh, old uh, style Ukrainian singer from the Soviet era. Maybe. No, I don't remember that. We got Minnesota, Colorado here, Washington State. Portland, we got UP, Michigan. I've been in Traverse City just recently with my son. Went to see some uh, fall colors, didn't see any. It's really late now. <clears throat> All right, so next question from Aaron. Oh, hold on, we got another donation. $2 from Cup Rock. Let's see, one, two, thank you. Uh, what did Stalin do to, Christian, uh, to Christians that openly worship? Uh, in the beginning, he went hardcore after Christians. Um, like I remember stories my mom told me that even when she went to school, so my mother was born in 48. So she was kind of towards the end because I think Stalin died in 1953. But there'll be teachers, like in the villages was a little bit less uh, problems, but the teacher would stand next to the church on Sunday and offer uh, Christians to go to church uh, to babysit their children because otherwise if if somebody will get up there will get a, information that parents take children to church and teacher doesn't do anything about it, teacher will get in trouble. Uh, so during Stalin, like early area, uh, before the war, you know, they were destroying churches and there was not, you know, you shouldn't be openly Christian in any other like alternative religions that was even worse and then when the war started and it went really bad for stalin uh he realized that he cannot uh, you know people are not being inspired by you know dying for him or for ideas of communism so that was almost like 180 flip and they actually got church involved and it came up with all these old russian symbols and old russian you know heroes like kutuzov and suvorov so they kind of put back all the communist uh, uh, slogans and they started bringing the history of, you know, we're fighting like Russians now against the evil. Uh, but I'm not sure about Christian prosecutions, but uh, I said a lot of churches were closed and um, a lot of uh, church workers, uh, priests were arrested and shot. So yeah, they, he was like not taking his sweet time when it came to molding a new Soviet, uh, you know, person it should be you know an atheist a strong believer in communism ideas and of course uh, love stalin uh there's a comment i'm from outside new york city but my mom lived down the road from you in niles as a child yep niles michigan uh really close kind of cute little town has really neat uh, a train station there uh, Illinois question, how's your brother? Um, he's doing okay. I mean, he's on kind of front lines in Kharkiv region, um, operating Starlink communication system with his, uh, whatever group he works with. And uh, so he's like, goes to the front lines and then they go back. So like taking shifts. 
so so far so good in arc and wood yeah it's pretty scary i mail him a bunch of winter boots and gear so he's doing okay but yeah it's really stressful so i hope i mean i i hope but i don't think this uh, war will end anytime soon Is it easy for people who use a uh, Cyrillic alphabet uh, to learn the Latin alphabet? Uh, try to learn Cyrillic, but I find it's very hard. It's almost seem every Slavic can use both alphabets with these. I mean, they, there's a lot of really similarities, but once you learn a uh, Slavic alphabet, like Russian, Ukrainian, the easy part is now you can read. Like we don't have really strange rules, you know, that a letter A can be A or almost O or A. R is R. I mean, it may, may sound not like strong R. So once you learn alphabet, there's a couple of confusing letters. Like our uh, R, it looks like your P, uh, P, and our Ya looks like backwards, backwards R. But it's only what, 32 letters. I mean, anybody can memorize them. Most of them look the same. I is A. Then, of course, our B, B, looks a little bit different. Um, C will say S. Uh, so it's, I mean, once you get going a little bit on it, there's a plenty of YouTube channels. Uh, once you memorize alphabet, I think you, you know, the easy part is you can read anything. And there's a lot of rules that are more complicated, like we have endings. Like if it's a good boy and a good girl in Russian, it will be хороший мальчик и хорошая девочка. So ending ends changes like in Spanish. So, but yeah, I, I, I think, you know, it's a hard language to learn, but like if you do alphabet, you can just start reading right away. It's it's pretty easy because we don't have a rules of the sounds change. You know, two O's don't make sound O, anything like that, you know. Okay. Almost got 50 people. Thank you uh, joining tonight. Hey, Ivano, back from Australia. Greetings, 11 a.m. on Sunday. So it's a good time if you're in Australia. I got a little bit of the viewers from Australia. I got some postcards, and I actually had to mail some books to Australia. So that's pretty cool. <clears throat> Arizona, hello, Nick. Uh, thank you for joining. If people are homeless, it's uh, 10 times harder to have a shower, shave, and then be presentable at, uh, for work. Oh, yeah, absolutely. But like my parents, uh, we lived in a, you know the dorms, family dorms for five years. Uh, they shower once a week. <laughs> On Sundays, it was only available hot water, hot shower in a locked basement. Otherwise, it's only cold uh, water in a communal kitchen. So, you know, I mean, the whole hygiene story, it's a different one. But, yeah, it was totally normal. Um, I mentioned several times I took a bath once a week on Sundays. Even we had hot water every day in our apartment. And if middle of the week, like maybe Wednesday or Thursday, I feel like my hair is getting, you know, kind of uh, shiny, sticky. I'll just go and I just wash my hair in a tub, uh, in a bathtub. And now I'm thinking, like, why don't I just get in a take a bath or, you know, had like this uh, shower head. I, it never clicked. I would just wash my head and, yeah, pretty wild. Uh, there's a uh, conversation about housing. Uh, they have addiction, mental health problems. They provide housing. At least they have a chance. I think they need to have a special housing. And that's the thing is like, uh, I think it started under Ronald Reagan when he uh, basically uh, cut funding for mental facilities and a lot of people end up going on the streets. Um, because yeah, if you, everyone pretty much should have a relatives or siblings, right? You have parents. So it makes me wonder like, what kind of person you are that even your own parents don't want you to have in your house. Like usually, you know, I wouldn't tell my son, hey, you can't stay with us. You know, yeah, you need to get your you know shit straight. I'm sorry for my language. But if your own parents or siblings doesn't don't let you stay with them till you get your, you know, stuff all straightened up and uh, get going again in your life, you know, it's like 
I, I don't know how, who else to blame. And once again, I keep on repeating, and some tankies were uh, not happy with my statements because this whole idea of pulling yourself by uh, bootstraps, it's doable. It was extremely hard, um, but I even like having no relatives, hardly any people I knew in America, I never lived on the street. Uh, I had people, you know, on the farm. I mean, I was kind of homeless, but a uh, farmer didn't mind. He trusted me that I won't steal anything. I lived on a loft in the market. I mean, if you read my books, you know that story, right? American Diaries, 95, 96, almost down was 97. Um, yeah. So then I stayed with other Americans I met. And uh, for a while, I lived with another uh, guy from Latvia. He had a construction business. And basically, I worked for him and I lived in his house. Um, you know, he didn't pay me much, but it was free housing. So there's options out there. So if I could uh, find something of having no relatives, no friends, uh, I don't know why other people have hard time and they have to live in the cardboard boxes. You know, they have fluent English. I didn't. You know, they're citizens of the United States. So basically, you know, no one need to check your all the you know documentation and social security. You're like all set, but somehow you just you know, can't keep the job. It's it's pretty wild. And I know some people. Um, I met some Americans uh, that they just can't work. You know, eight till five would drive them nuts. I, you know, I'm lucky. I'm okay. You know, I work a lot. You know, I appreciate that I'm getting an opportunity. And I, I think I mentioned before. You know, being a foreigner and you, know, my English is my third language. I'll never be fluent. I will never be the sharpest knife in a drawer. Um, but I can try to be one of the most reliable knives in a drawer. And I, I noticed, you know, empl employers appreciate that. Almost every job I had, I have been offered promotions. I mean, even like it's a farm level, like, hey, you know, we would like you to hire you as a manager of the farm market. You know, hoo hoo, big deal. But oh, anyway, so, yeah, it's it's a tough question. But, you know, amount of money the United States spent on a lot of stuff, you know, we give, what, $9 billion to Israel every year. I mean, Ukraine has a war going on, so I think it's justifiable. Then they give other countries money to buy American weapons. You know, this is probably easy to find enough money to build housing and, like, mental facilities, you know, and just basically accept people. Military should take care of their military veterans. I mean, there's another thing. I think it looks bad when you, you, you know, take people then they got mentally damaged with all that war experience and then they end up living on the streets uh so <clears throat> so yeah okay so let's see i'm trying to catch up what else oh by the way uh <laughs> so since most of you are Americans, but you're probably all too young, I started this project. So I have a Russian language channel uh, that I tell people in the former Soviet Union about life in America. Uh, so the topic of um, hitchhiking came up. Uh, so, you know, it's dead in the United States right now. And apparently in most states it's still legal to hitchhike. It's in 44 states. Illinois and New York, New Jersey, it's illegal. I believe in Alaska, it's the law to pick up hitchhiker. <clears throat> so I wonder if anybody of you guys have experience hitchhiking or picking up hitchhikers uh, because it's kind of, I figure out, I started asking people at work and I noticed anyone younger than 50, they just look at me, they have this deer in the headlight look like, are you crazy? You know, stranger danger. That's what they learn in school. They don't pick up hitchhikers, they never hitchhike themselves. You know, only in case like car broke down and somebody picked you up. So I wonder if any of you maybe have an explanation why it died out. It looks like in the early 80s. Uh, so it's because um, when I work at the farm and Herb, uh, my farm owner, Herb, uh, he was older gentleman. Like I think he was born in early 1930s, maybe. Um, so he like hitchhiked when he was in the Navy. He Finished Navy, he hitchhiked from California all the way back to Michigan. Uh, so that was total normal thing. So that's an interesting topic to discover, to discuss uh, why did hitchhiking die in America and any experiences. I picked up a couple of hitchhikers here in, in Michigan. Um, 
one was really wild story might as well just tell you i was driving to work 6 a.m kind of little country road dark and suddenly at the stop sign i see a chick a lady in a mini skirt and high heels standing hitchhiking i was like man it doesn't look right it's almost looked like you know uh beginning of the kind of the you know poor cheap uh, uh, horror movie or cheap porn movie <laughs> but i was like man that doesn't look right you know because the little like cornfields you know a stop sign and the girl there but i was like maybe there's she's in problem so i stopped like rolled the window down i'm driving my prius and this girl, like, you know, all mascara run down. She's like uh, sobbing. She's like, you know, some party was going on. So it's Saturday morning. And she got into a fight with her boyfriend. And he's trying to beat her up. So she ran away. So she walking from that party, whatever that place was. And she needs a ride to a nearby station, gas station. And she thinks her boyfriend is chasing her. And uh, suddenly I hear the scratch rock as there's a motorcycle pulled to the side of my car. And the guy looks at me from his motorcycle. I'm looking at him. The girl in my car already i like man uh but fortunately i had on my chest i wore the work t-shirt and i'm firefighter and just part of my job so and the logo looked kind of firefighter cop look and he think he saw logo he thought i'm a cop so he took off and i took that girl to a gas station so that was my craziest kind of experience and hitchhiking but of course in soviet union my family never owned the car uh, and i never hitchhiked at all uh, so yeah, but it's an interesting topic to see. Okay, um, so this question from Aaron: You have talked about needing permission to do many things in Soviet Union, such as to move to a city. Uh, what other examples there compared to the USA? Well, permission to go anywhere like out of country for travel, and that was the worst uh, experience you could get. Of course, you know. First of all, you need to get a chance to buy this uh, traveling voucher. And then, of course, you need to get uh, your co-workers who have a meeting and they will vote if you are trustworthy to go. And then KGB will look at it, this whole big uh, deal. <clears throat> so that was the worst. About permission to move, like you could move to any city. You just, uh, in order to stay in a city uh, permanently, you needed to get a Propiska permission. Uh, so if you have like a place, some factory wants you, you know, then you can move into their dorms. Or if you're some really important specialist, they can provide you with an apartment. And then this way you get Propiska. And, but otherwise, uh, not that comparing with America in that regards. Uh, I mean, some some rules in America, it's actually more like, you know, if you live in some housing association, maybe they don't, they don't allow you to have a garden. You know, that's kind of weird for uh, people from the former Soviet Union because they just can do anything every, anywhere they want. Uh, so, yeah, it's uh, that was pretty much the biggest problem, I'd say. And then work-wise, you know, a lot of places of work in the Soviet Union were military related, working for. Uh, so, if you need to get it, want to get a job there, they will process your papers to like KGB. You need to fill up paperwork that you, uh, you or your relatives never been in occupied territory. Just, just crazy stuff. But generally, said I when I was a kid. I mean, I became, I turned twenty in nineteen ninety one when the Soviet Union went belly up. Uh, you know, I bumped just a little bit my worst experience with the soviet bureaucracy was when i was trying to get um, uh, into college uh, to be a sausage engineer remember that whoever watched that video and the lady you know you provide you know your documents it was also medical uh, spravka so it your health condition and she saw that my eyesight she checked her paper she said you are too blind to uh, be a student here and i was like it was a shock for me. I didn't know there's some kind of limitations on the eyesight to be a college student, but I was that college. But when I asked her, like, can you look, where can I go? She went for the list and said, you can go to Kiev Polytechnical Institute to be engineer, welded, welding engineer. So there's this kind of this dumbest bureaucracy that you can be engineer for welding with your poor eyesight, but you can be a sausage engineer. So that was like pretty wild. Uh, 
Uh, there's a YouTube channel de uh, dedicated to Chernobyl. He goes deep in the topic. Have you seen it? No, I mean, I, I'm i not really, like, into this detail. There's a lot of uh, people. I follow a Reddit channel about Chernobyl, and some people have this crazy fascination about it. You know, for me, as the person who lived nearby and how much trouble it caused, you know, I, I don't find it fascinating at all. It's, you know, it was a, was a really bad um, ex industrial accident with a huge consequences. But I I don't see the reason to dig in every tiny detail, like, uh, you know, follow the life story of every firefighter or every person who worked there. <clears throat> so, yeah, I don't follow. I just follow the Chernobyl subreddit because I can sometimes answer some questions if people ask. Uh, Got some comments about spelling. Okay, so there's a Jose. Hello, comment Sergey. Question about football hooligans. Hooligani. Nowadays in Russia, maybe even in Ukraine, hooligans in football seems a big problem. What about Soviet time? Were there any hooligans? We had a little bit of that problem, not much. And you know, of course, during the Soviet uh, days, uh, mass media, newspapers, radio, TV will never report if there'll be some uh, fighting. Uh, back then. The major противостояние, uh, can't say how to say it in English. So people who hated each other the most, like uh, uh, fans, will be Spartak Moskva and Dynamo Kiev. So my home team, soccer team, Dynamo Kiev in Spartak Moskva, for some reason, we were like the worst rivals in that regard. Maybe they were one of the best teams in the Soviet Union. And uh, they traveled for the games here to Kiev. Some guys traveled to those games in, not many, but some. And I think so there will be maybe some issues, but not like it turned out to be, like when I was researching topic, what happened in Odessa, when there was a fire in that uh, labor union building and people died, uh, there was literally a lot of these movements based on the soccer fans, so like from Donetsk, even like they're from Donetsk, but they were like uh, hardcore pro-Ukrainian nationalist, you know, fans. And their team is from Donetsk Shakhtar, the coal miner team. But otherwise, I don't recall any stories uh, that were had some major fighting. There maybe were some, but I said media never reported, so we never knew about it. It kind of grew bigger when people uh, had more money, more time, they could go and travel. Uh, I would never even think about going anywhere else to watch, you know, Dynamo Kiev, my soccer team, my home team playing somewhere else. It's just, it was really weird. It was quite rare. Because traveling even by train was pretty expensive. Even, even like uh, T-shirts, all that stuff, it was hardly anything for sale. People had to like do homemade logos and everything. It was not a huge business. So... And as well, like when I experienced when I came to Michigan first time in 1995 and I went to local supermarket, Myers, I was shocked when I see all these jerseys and T-shirts and hats, Michigan, Michigan, Michigan. And I thought like, wow, it's crazy. I never knew that people would be so proud of their state. It never clicked with me. I never knew that they were, it was a football team, Michigan, you know, yellow letters, dark blue. I thought it's the like oh people are so proud they live in michigan they're willing to wear t-shirts or whatever so yeah it was we didn't have that at all uh, during the soviet days <clears throat> a question from justin clark uh, has your mom ever visited you in the usa yes she did once i think i have a video about it uh, let me see i'll post the link i will find it i think it was in 19 in 2005 Let's see, visit 700 people, Hong Kong. Okay, so yeah, I have a video. My mother visit uh, part one and part two. I'll post the link. I might need to repost it again. So mom's visit. Yeah, that was a... Uh, Interesting thing because my mother, she never flew on the plane. So once again, just just it's a different life in in the United States. It's you know in Soviet Union, like my parents, my father I think flew twice, and my mother never flew in her life. Uh, so when uh, I you know said, hey, how about you? Well, first of all, we tried to. I invited my brother to come and visit, 
and he was like 16. Um, so he went to American embassy in Ukraine and I told them, uh, no, because you're not direct relatives. So according to American standards, mother, father are direct relatives. Your brother is not your direct relative. So my brother, he got so crushed, you know, 16 year old kid, you know, first time go to America to see his big brother. And the embassy said, no, you know, we wasted hundred bucks. Uh, it was quite disheartening, I think is the word. And after that, he never even talked about it going again. But my mama said she, uh, since she never flew on a plane, so she was scared. So she said one condition that uh, I'll come and visit you, but I'm not changing planes anywhere. I'm getting on a plane in Kiev, and I get off the plane, and you're right there. So I had to drive all the way to New York uh, to pick her up. And I just posted two videos, links. That's the story of my mom's visit. And we went to another Michigan uh, visited state and the Grateful Lodge was a brand new that back then, I think. And she stayed with us for a month. Uh, and she basically had enough of one month and she never expressed interest to come back. I think she, she likes to talk, you know, uh, communicate. My wife doesn't speak any Russian or Ukrainian. I had to work a little bit, so it was a little challenge. I took her down to Indiana to see Amish. Anyways, there's two videos there. So yeah, that was uh Uh, there a comment i found a travel guide for the soviet union that was released a couple of months before it collapsed 600 pages wow that's pretty cool if, i wonder if it's available online to see i'm being cool to check it out <clears throat> okay Try to catch you guys here. There's this people discussing the uh, situation with uh, housing. So I'm just skipping those. I'm glad you guys, I'm still waiting uh, to see if, uh, although it's really chances are tiny because only 7% of my viewers are female. Uh, like I would like to get invited to the wedding of people who met each other on Oshanka show, but I think chances are very, very low. Let's see. Got several people in uh, talking about Upper Michigan. So they're coming back to the uh, hitchhiking. Sticking your thumb out is uncommon, but asking someone walking if they need a ride is still common in the South. Uh, yeah, as I said, I was asking questions at work, and um, one lady, she's a cleaning lady, and she's just in her 63, she said, yeah, back when I was, we were teenagers, like 1920, we hitchhiked to a concert to Kalamazoo from Waterloo, so it's about 50 miles, so they would walk, a couple of girls that walk to the highway, to the, you know, entry ramp on the highway, and they will hitchhike to get to concert, it was some band area or something, or area, area some popular, I guess, teen band in the 80s. And they go to concert, you know, hitchhike. And then at the concert, they'll meet someone who they know and they'll take them back from concert. She, she says she did it several times. Uh, and only one time uh, there was some guy in a station wagon who had all his crap and he was asking these two girls, teenage girls, and he was older gentlemen that if they like to party and he wanted to party with them. So they said, well, there's a liquor store uh, why don't you stop, you know, pull over and go get some beer? We'll party with you. So when he went to the store and they bolted, left the car and ran away. So, yeah, it's uh, it's pretty crazy. You know, now I said I'm the younger generation. I mean, unfortunately, I have to say that because I'm, you know, 1971. Uh, I ask Americans and they're like looking at me like I'm on crack. Like, oh, no, I never picked up anyone. I never, you know, hitchhiked myself. Uh I had a couple of the one guy was a gas can. I picked him up, took him to gas station, going to town. Then he asked if I can take him back to his place where his car was. So I told him, hey, you need to wait. You know, I got to do some errands to run. And he was really scared that I forget about him. And then we had a couple of, so I actually picked up quite a few hitchhikers here in, in Michigan, more than normal American. Uh, so, yeah. We got some people even from uh, St. Petersburg, Russia. 
Hello, Марат. I don't know if you understand. Я не знаю, что много понимаешь, о чем я говорю, но thanks for joining. Let's see. Okay, so question, were the houses provided for free in the Soviet Union? No. Uh, in rare cases, uh, if the collective farm... So most houses were out in the country and apartment buildings were in the cities. So, and of course, you know, the way the city developed, they will tear down houses and build apartments and that's how people will get... But the house you need to build yourself or buy. Uh, so land will be still belongs to the government or collective farm, whatever, but house is yours you could sell it we had no uh, property tax so that was nice but i said the problem was only on house <clears throat> even if you had money you had to be like really inventive to build your own uh, like a uh, sewage system because there was nothing available like that we just didn't have it you know you couldn't just go to the store and buy pipes and all that stuff to have a plumbing in your house and i think i told you the story uh, when my brother got married his uh so the parents-in-law now they actually had a house i was impressed in northern ukraine in, in snowsk in the small town but the guy was like a director of the uh alcohol refinery plant so you know they were making alcohol out of wheat out of grain um so they built a house for directors so if you get this position you, you move in that house and then of course if you leave the new director gets their house. And that was the only house I've ever seen that had indoor plumbing. And that was like, wow, I couldn't believe it. But the funny fact, they still used outhouse for number one and number two because it turned out to be very expensive to pump it uh, because they just had a tank. They didn't have a sept like a septic system, you know, with the drain field. It's just a tank, so everything goes in tanks. So it fills really quick because if you don't let the water escape, uh, so they literally disconnected the line under the sink, so you still can wash your hands using hot water and cold water, but then you have to carry the bucket from the sink, below sink and uh, dump it outside, but you still need to go and use outhouse. So there was this b bizarre, almost like a hybrid system. You have a plumbing, but you don't use it because it's too expensive. Like they had a, a tub they never used. That was crazy. <clears throat> All right, we got another donation. Thank you so much from Steve. Um, this is from my mom. Thank you so much. Hope she's doing great and the war ends soon. Thank you. I appreciate it. Uh, she actually was in, let's see, we got three here, two here. No, hold on. So it makes it 12. Okay, so now we got 10 and to $12 right here. <laughs> We got to have this thing, bought it a long time ago. Yeah, so in a nearby village, uh, Russian troops, there was a propane tanker uh, delivering uh, propane to the local locals, you know, so, and a hit, drone hit it, and the, like five civilians died, and one four-year-old kid. Uh, so that was a nearby village to my mom, and I think she said, uh, she decided it's too scary, so she... She's going back to Kiev, stay in apartment. So yeah, so if you have a ho houses you have to buy, except if you are like some specialist, then they will provide you with housing. By the way, we need to catch up with likes. And we got only 39. <clears throat> Yeah, simple workout to defeat companies. Yeah, I just said it's got the T-shirt, and it just shows you different things you can do to get strong. Uh, some of my viewers thought it was a funny T-shirt, so you sent it to me. So I guess you know you'll become a well, Ivan Draga actually he was a uh, on the Soviet side. Justin says, I like the Sergey is very good and clear speaker. Uh, thank you so much. Um, doing my best. I'm trying. <laughs> so back to council education. You're better off now not having been a sausage engineer. Um, I guess so. It's just you never know. You know, sometimes I look back and 
what I'm writing right now in 1997 diary, and I, I think I mentioned before, it dawned on me, like, okay, my parents, you know, they're just busy trying to provide, you know, all that stuff. But my teacher, Russian language, she saw that I had something. Like, she actually read my uh, essays, like when we read the book, and then we need to write, you know, story based on that book, like what my... What did I learn from it? And a couple of times she was so impressed with my essays that she wrote it, she read it in the front of the whole class. It was embarrassing, kind of, and I was proud, but I was also embarrassed. Uh, but she never ever suggested, like, hey, Sergey, you may want to consider, you know, maybe becoming a journalist or writer. You know, there's these colleges that you could probably look into it and we'll go talk to them, you know, take your essays, show it to them, maybe, you know, never she gave me excellent grades but never ever mentioned i was like well i guess when you're a teacher maybe it's one of your kind of like jobs is to you know guide people not like you know of course in america like tell every kid you have no future if you don't go to college but at least like if you see some people some pupils students are specifically good at some field math or writing you know, maybe kind of give them a little push and direction. I mean, I think it's a teacher job besides teaching, but nope, she never did that. So I don't know how my life would go if I try going that route and get into college, but probably without my without connections, I don't think I'll pass. But when I was going to Kiev Polytechnical Institute, I had to pass three tests, uh, math, physics, and then it was Russian language. So in Kiev, capital of Ukraine, you go into Russian speaking college because of the Russian speaking colleges. And the third subject, it's a Russian uh, literature. So, you know, and it was, you never know what topic is going to be, but. All right, I'm back. I apologize. I'm not sure if it's a YouTube glitch or my computer. It looks like it was YouTube. I hope we have some people will <laughs> recycle and go back here. We'll chat for another 20 minutes or so. I'll wait. So yeah, I'm not sure. It's a second time last uh, live. I guess exactly the same problem is I had some uh, thing popped and it stopped. So I'm not sure. I'm back. It's a different. Uh, I restarted again the live. I'm not sure what's going on with the other one. I think it should be. Let's see. I'll wait a minute. See if people will show up. It still says it's live. Oh, that's part two. Okay, so I'm live. 106. Okay, so that one is looks like we got it wrapped up. And we got this one going live. So we should be good. <coughs> okay, uh, so yeah, I'm back to questions. We'll do another uh, 20 minutes or so, then we'll be wrapping up. Okay, uh, so it looks like people are just jumping right back in. Uh, question about tattoos. I'm planning to do a video on it. Uh, tattoos, not really uh, were like popular. People were doing tattoos for a reason. So when you go to prison, you get a prison tattoo, and those were a big, big deal because everything they got on like rings on their uh, fingers tattooed, it's a different crimes they committed. So just looking at each other fingers, they know what person did. You know, then if you watch the movie Eastern Promises, you know, there's the stars. So everything was like symbolic. Uh, so there's one was kind of that type of uh, tattooing. And usually uh, like sailors, if they go to Navy, uh, they will tattoo, you know, anchor and other stuff. So otherwise, yeah, we didn't have at all this whole culture. Uh, was no professional tattoo uh, studios or nothing like that. And I don't think I knew anybody who had a tattoo. Uh, was not popular at all. And I don't have any tattoos. Uh, actually, I was thinking, <laughs> put a Ushanka Show logo if I'll reach 100,000. But they're like, nah. Oh, we got even India. That's awesome. This is really far away. Okay, see what else we got questions. Uh, how was the quality of the power grid in the Soviet Union? Not too bad. 
but you know we didn't have a lot of uh, load on our grid uh, because we didn't use air conditioning those people had we had no air conditioning like at all like not in apartments not in houses i not in cars and it's like one of the heaviest loads <clears throat> so i don't remember losing power for uh you know, kiev was the capital of ukraine so to be fair out of all places uh kiev will be the last place to lose power but when we were in the village with my grandparents i don't remember losing uh power ever because i don't recall any then of course after my grandparents passed away, they cut off the wires. So then we just use candles or kerosene lamps. The only time actually when I experienced a, a failing power grid was all after Soviet Union uh, collapsed. So independent Ukraine. So we're talking maybe 92, 93. Uh, I was uh, working already as a junior engineer. And we were sent uh, to the business trip down to eastern Ukraine, to Donetsk region. Uh, the town called Hartsysk, and I believe right now it's occupied by Russia. So it's like a coal mining area. And they put us in a hotel, and we came to work for the local uh, power authority power plant. They had some issues with communication system that they bought from us. So we went, and you know, it was like it was 7 p.m. maybe, and suddenly lights went out, and we're like, what the heck? So someone, you know, went downstairs uh, to the uh, register, whatever. He asked what's going on. She's like, oh, uh, they turn off power at 7 p.m. So this is first time I experienced situation when there was like this planned uh, brownouts, right? They call them not well, a blackout, a brownout. They schedule uh, shutting off power. And that was a real shock to me. And then I think village in northern Ukraine started having the same problem. But Kiev was always uh, had no problems. And then they moved us to a different hotel that belonged to actually the power plant, and we had no uh, power shutoffs. So that's first time. Hey, we got some uh, $5 from New Zealand. Hello, Adam. Thank you so much. Appreciate your support. I don't know what is the rate of exchange of New Zealand, but we'll add. So you see, we got 12 right now, right? Two here, one, two, it's 12. So we got five more. Yeah, we got 17. Oh my God, works like a charm. Even if we lose power, I'll still have that number. Uh, thank you so much, Ed. I appreciate your support. Let's see. We'll talk about tattoos. Uh, so question, Anthony, is it possible to order a signed copy of your books? Yes, uh, it's just a problem with shipping. It's kind of pricey. And you need to look, uh, find out about uh, taxes uh, in England. If you look at my website, uh, sputnikov.com, if you order from that website, I will be shipping the books. So sputnikov.com, there is a way to order to the other countries. It's more, unfortunately, shipping is pretty expensive. Uh, but I'll sign and I'll actually, I bribe people, I'll put some uh, Soviet era rubles in there. So yeah, it's possible. So yeah, just uh, place the order, send me email at sergeysputnikov at gmail.com. Okay, let's see. I recently found your channel and I really like it. Well, thank you so much, appreciate it. Um, I'm a Somalia, uh, from Somalia and they're living in England at the moment. And Somalia was a Marxist Leninist government back then. Yeah. Well, there was a quite a big push in Africa, and uh, they support a lot of governments that were saying that they're communist or Marxist. As, like, as I mentioned many times, socialism sounds like a great idea, like a, it's a perfect system, but for the perfect people. And uh, there's not enough perfect people that will work hard for, you know, and not being uh, rewarded for it. So that's the main challenge. But the idea sounds sounds. Sounds great, but in practice, every time you apply, it always fails. In every socialist country, for some reason, it's always a dictatorship. You have a leader that will stay at power till he dies. So that's one of the worst, I think, uh, situations because for some reason, I don't know why, you know, once the one party uh, 
has a monopoly for power, there'll be one guy who has a monopoly for being a leader. There's no exchange and that stops, you know, it's really bad when a leader stays at power for, you know, 20, 30 years. Then look at Putin and Russia, not even socialist anymore. Uh, so question, did Russian Navy have any traditions about when a sailor crossed the equator? Uh, it's anybody, yeah, it's the same thing. Uh, Navy or uh, even a fleet for like trade ships, same thing. They have a Neptune and all this silliness of dunking people in the water and blasting them. Yeah, I never experienced that. Never crossed the equator in my life yet. But yeah, they have that too. I remember seeing pictures and stories. So this is this comment of, from uh, uh, Vin Guy, who is originally from Somalia. Somalia says a lot of Somalis are very positive and nostalgic to that uh, Soviet Marxist era. Uh, after I discovered there were some uh, s former slaves in the United States that were uh, nostalgic for slavery and they were looking for the ways to sell themselves back to slavery because they hated uh, free life. Uh, they hated you know, making decisions, looking for a job. Because when they were slaves, they had a free housing, free health care, 100% employment, and suddenly they have to uh, fend off for themselves. So I'm not surprised that uh, people who lived in the Soviet Union, Somalia, Cuba, some of them will be still nostalgic for those days when they didn't have to worry about anything. Oh, we got another donation from Steve. Thank you, Steve. We got, so we, we need to add five now. So we got three here. Boom, boom, two, 22. Thank you so much, Chris. So your question, can I ask you what that brown bottle is to your left next to the picture and who is she on the photo? My left, all right, so that's my wife, Cheryl, born and raised in Michigan. I met her on a blind date. Uh, eventually, I'll have a book about those uh, parts. Uh, so, yeah, she's a cutie patootie. And this brown bottle is a uh, flask, flashka. Uh, one of my uh, subscribers on my Russian YouTube channel sent it to me. So it's a glass bottle, but it's wrapped in a birch bark, I believe. So it's kind of like a souvenir. It should be full of vodka. That's what it's supposed to be. And it's from Krasnoyarsk. So that's a Siberian city. So that's the cedar nuts, I guess. So it's kind of like the souvenir item. Um, back in the day when, yeah, you could see there's the birch bark. You see that pattern? That's the like Biroza bark. It's, and even a cap is wrapped in the bark. So it's kind of a little cool souvenir. Uh, so yeah, it's keep it there. I used to get also, you know, parcels and mail from uh, Russia back in the days. But of course, after Putin went to war, of course, nothing, everything stopped. But yeah, that's. <clears throat> so have a good night. Thank you, Steve, again for your um, support. Let's see what else we got here for questions. Let's see. Have there ever been devices like electric kettles uh, that use a lot of watts? Yes, we had a water heater. So we didn't, I don't remember electric like kettle, but we had just, you know, the like plastic end and you have this metal part that's around and you stick in the water and it boils water. <clears throat> but I guess grid was strong enough. Now they have a big problem with grid uh, because people started using air conditioning. And, the, you know, when they design homes like those apartment buildings, they never designed wiring to handle that current. So uh, a lot of times they have to shut off the areas because when it's a hot day in the summer and everyone cranks the air conditioning, they just have to trip like big, large areas, kill the power because the grid can't handle it and the wire started having issues. So yeah, it's a, it's a great uh, problem generally because it was never designed uh, back in my days, 80s, 70s, we never had such a hot summers, and now it's 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 going really crazy, really hot.
Adam says, uh, thank you for uh, for your channel and the stories, information you share. Thank you so much. I, I'm glad I, I remember a lot. Uh, this is I don't remember what I did last week, but I still have memories when I was, you know, little kid. And of course, I'm lucky that I have a lot of pictures. So I'll be still. I'm planning to do more, you know, just to kind of start taking uh, photos of my family. This is my grandma and my grandfather uh, bringing firewood back home. This is uh, 1976, 77. Uh, so I'll be planning. I'm planning to make more videos, just talking details about these pictures because I show a lot of photos. Uh, thanks to my uncle, he had a camera, but I never like talking to, in the detail about it. So there'll be more uh, kind of videos just about that, just to give you more of these little details that you will never find in the history books, but you will learn more about everyday life, especially there's more. Uh, coverage about city life you know when people talk about free housing they assume that everyone live in apartment building but you know huge territories the countryside people live in the houses we still had like in the 80s where people had still straw roofs like uh let me get that uh, let's see if i can reach it what is it i just saw it see that's mirror okay uh, so this is actually a postcard uh, from Ukraine, I don't know, early 1900s. Uh, well, and the house was the, it's either straw or it's the hatchet that the grass, tall grass that grows along the swamps and the rivers. And it's a Bakhmac. Uh, it's not Bakhmut, but Bakhmac. And that's how the housing is. So I saw this type of houses even in the 1980s. Uh, so. People are said is a lot of them don't understand that there was a, a lot of going on out in the country and the countryside collective farm workers they were like 50 years behind what people had in the cities and it's not being uh, discussed a lot. Everyone assume they all live in these nine story high or 16 story high apartment buildings. The rate of exchange is uh, okay so. Two New Zealand dollars for one American dollar. Okay, good to know. Thank you. Appreciate it, Adam. Once again, that technology. You know, Adam is in New Zealand. Uh, probably looking out the window, he see the Kiwi orchards, and um, uh, he can send money all the way to Michigan. This is crazy. The times. Um, back in the early like 2000, I was when I started my eBay. Uh, I was. When just when PayPal started, and PayPal was paying five dollars if somebody will buy your item and then sign up for PayPal. So that's how technology progressed. Now it's all done live, and oh man, it's pretty crazy. Let's see. Ask about power grid because Cuba on the blackout for three days now. Maybe they used USSR tech and now they can replace. It's possible. <clears throat> I mean. Cuba is a mess. I mean, I also follow on Reddit and they were talking about it. The grid will be falling. And I'm not sure if it's a grid failing because actual equipment or they just have no fuel to run it because Soviet Union used to send a lot of oil and, you know, bunker oil to run those uh, power plants because they don't. There's actually uh, actual unfinished nuclear plant. They tried to build nuclear plant in Cuba and then they abandoned it. And well, I appreciate it. Adam from New Zealand. It's his very first donation ever. So that's cool. I appreciate it. I'm the one that uh, you decided to uh, send some money. So I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Uh, and there's discussion about uh, Trotsky, Leon Trotsky, had the best explanation why Soviet Union turned out that way. Well, a lot of his predictions was like he was talking actually about Stalin. But he predicted that Soviet bureaucracy will betray. I think he has his whole book uh, written says uh, revolution betrayed, and he kind of predicted but it was no Stalin who betrayed. In the end, there was I mean, still was Soviet bureaucracy, but it was during the Gorbachev. Uh, Warren G says do more live streams. Um, I'm trying. Unfortunately, my schedule is pretty, you know, uh, busy, and also you know sometimes I have to make a choice. Do I need to go mow grass or? It's just today we went with my wife down to Indiana uh, to check it out. Uh, Amish, uh, 
went to Napanee, just kind of see this beautiful day. Then we came back a little bit early. I was like, you know what? Maybe I'll try to do live. So a lot of worked out. Adam says, Marty is flooding in today. Maybe he'll retire soon. Oh, be nice. I, I really enjoy doing YouTube. I like uh, doing books, you know, writing books and stuff. But unfortunately, it it's... I'll, my YouTube earnings will take care of my electric bill and maybe groceries for... Uh, you can stretch for groceries for one, two guys. Uh, otherwise, yeah, it's... Um, I said it's... I, I there's I see there's a possibilities, but for some reason YouTube just doesn't let my channel grow. Uh, it's uh, it just I don't know what's going on. It's like some people said I was being a shadow band or something because I would assume as a amount of videos I made about Soviet Union, anyone who enters anything into the search about the USSR should have a Shanka show as the first thing to watch, and it's definitely not showing up. Uh, there's a question again from Adam uh, about pine flavor toothpaste. I think we did have it. I, I I don't remember using it. I preferred it was one children's toothpaste. It was so delicious that I actually tried to eat it. <laughs> but usually just we were buying just a normal mint flavor. I don't recall using pine flavor. It sounds bad. I am uh, says the I don't check Facebook often. I sometimes if there's somebody who sends that I don't know messages, they disappear, so I don't see it. So I apologize if I missed your message. Uh, Timothy has a question: Did they air old movies like uh, they met in Moscow or Tractor Drivers on TV? I think so. Periodically, I mean, there was a movie showing. I don't know about every day, but. Several times a week in the evening, they'll show movies. I don't know how often they show old, old movies. I don't uh, honestly recall. But, yeah, they, they would run. They had to to fill the channels. Uh, question, was there uh, ever anti-car sentiment? Oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> To have a car, this is like you are you are on the top of the world. There was like you could see so many photos of these people probably standing next to the Lada's or Moskvich because this is like, you know, this is ultimate success of the Soviet life. If you have a husband who decides to get in your apartment, also manage to get a car. It's like yeah, this is a, then this car will be transferred to your children, to the grandchildren. So yeah, there was no anti-car. No, we didn't have many cars. Period. Which was nice. We never had traffic jams. I don't recall ever. Uh, Steve, you're feeling generous today. I appreciate it. So another five dollars. See one, two, three, four, five. Okay. Shorty works fine. I'm so fascinated <laughs> by your background of your streams. I'm wondering what is the clock and a statue behind. Okay, so now we got to turn this way. Yep, I'm learning. <clears throat> okay, so this is the working Soviet clock. My mom, uh, I think she found it or she saw it on the flea market. See, that it's written Zdel of SSSR, made in Soviet Union. It still works. Unfortunately, I'm missing this push button to make the alarm shut up. But otherwise, let's see, boy. to work hmm. maybe it quit but it was working and alarm is really loud and the bottle this is actually modern days uh, one of my friends bought me it's the it's the vodka bottle. So it's a Ukrainian Kozak. So it's like a souvenir bottle. And I think it's like around 2005. 
So we used to have this like with decoration statues you can buy made of far four porcelain. But yeah, that's the was the vodka bottle. I was very scared. <coughs> Excuse me, having it in my luggage. Because man, if that thing will bust it, it'll be a bad day. And usually my wife is kinda organizing my background to make sure it's everything looks neat. So most of it, yeah, it's a book, Soviet books, and knickknacks from my days and Soviet days. All right, see what else we got here. We'll be give another seven minutes because I'm starting losing. Do you still have an electric samovar? We never had electric samovar. My family, we just boiled water in a cheap pot on the stove, and otherwise in the village, um, just to put in a. Like there's even more small little boilers you put in a glass, just a glass glass. <clears throat> oh, Adam writes that he from New Zealand. He visited actually Lake Baikal and saw the same place as my American. Well, he is my distant relative. I call him Uncle. Bob, but not really my real uncle, but like back in the Soviet Union, a, any like kids will call any male adult that you don't know just Dyadja. So it translates as uncle, but any like who was it? Oh, some Dyadja, some dude, some older guy, some mister. Mister was, I guess, would be Dyadja, but also Dyadja means your uncle. So a comment about modern Ukraine and uh, Russian rural areas. Well, the sign of proud ownership in our in the country is the privacy fence, so-called America, they call it privacy fence. So you should have a tall fence that no one sees what's going on inside. So that was a big deal. Uh, Justin asking about uh, World War II. Uh, can you talk about how World War II history was taught? We never learned uh, World War II history. Uh, we only learned Great Patriotic War history. Um, yeah, it's I can make some videos, but it's basically World War, World War We had nothing to do with World War II. Uh, we only uh, participated in the World War II after May 1945, when the Soviet Union moved troops out of the East and attacked Japan. Uh, before that, uh, we had nothing to do with World War II. We were just minding our own business, and then Germany unexpectedly attacked us on the June 22, 1941, and the Great Patriotic, Patriotic War had begun. Before that, Soviet Union had nothing to do with World War II. They were just, you know, really, Stalin was really scared of Hitler, despite the fact they had the largest army in the world and more tanks than the rest of the world combined, but he was very scared. So in order to please and peace, peace uh, Hitler, he was sending him oil, all strategic materials, just to make sure that uh, Hitler will be a good guy and won't attack the Soviet Union ever. So this is kind of general story, but sure, we can make a video on that topic. So question uh, from Anna, was there a huge difference between uh, apartments old apartments and post-war apartments uh, yeah there was well i think i have a couple of videos on this topic so the newest ones would be khrushchevka so khrushchev era this is a five-story apartments then brezhnev era they go nine story high and 16 story high and i'm planning to make a video why those uh, heights were chosen so uh, Khrushchevka apartments had no elevators. So five stories, you have to climb the stairs. And even if you're not getting younger, you still have to climb the stairs. So all the old people had to constantly exercise, at least so you can make it to the fifth floor. <clears throat> uh, before that, the main difference will be, I stay, when I, uh, in 1986, when Chernobyl blew up and I went, uh, my parents sent me to stay with uh, my friend's grandma in Leningrad area, and she lived in the apartment. So that was a probably pre-war build or maybe shortly after war. 
It was like three story high uh, brick apartment building. She had only cold water. They had no hot water at all. So just cold water in the kitchen, cold water. I don't think she had a bath, like bath, she didn't have it. It was just a toilet, you know, so we had a toilet room. And it was the key, but so in order to get washed, you need to go to like a communal bath, bath house. And Steven became a member of my channel today. Thank you, Steve. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you for joining the team. But also, I have a playlist called Soviet Housing, and I just uh, put the video. Uh, let me see if I have a, I'll give you the link. So that's all the topics in the Soviet housing is there. You should see. Really quick. Okay, Soviet housing. 23 videos on that topic. Uh, so you can learn a lot. So it's, you know, it's really not convenient if you have a running water but no hot water. So yeah, that was kind of bizarre. It's the first time I experienced because when I was little and living in the dorms, I didn't re don't didn't remember really. But yeah, my mom had to bring uh, you know heat up water on the stove, bring it in our room, and use it in a little bath metal bathtub. And that's how I took a bath once a week. <clears throat> but uh, Stalin era apartments uh, also had a taller ceiling, so there was better. I guess as this higher ceilings is better air circulation. And then Khrushchev apartments, in order to make them a lot and fast, they really made them tiny. Tiny apartments, low ceiling. Uh, so, all right, Stephen, thank you so much. Uh, another donation from Stephen. We got another three there. Boom. Just doing my calculations. Since you have so many books behind you, please pick your favorite one to show us and explain. Oh, my goodness. I mean, I could self-promote myself and uh, show you my own book. <clears throat> Let's see. Well, a lot of them in Russian language, so definitely. Well, I'll show you my surprise book. This is a book that really caught me by surprise. Um, and I'm surprised that, <laughs> surprise, surprise, that not many people know about it. So an American engineer in Stalin's Russia, memories of Zara Witkin. So he went, as you see, to Russia, Soviet Russia, Soviet Union, between 1932 and 1934. And he is a son of the uh, Russian Jewish immigrants who immigrated to the America. And he grew up. Uh, kind of like a tanky. So he was all excited about, because at that time, you know, you had a um, depression, Great Depression in America. So it looks like a, you know, capitalism. Capitalism was like a sick puppy on its last leg. So he thought that socialism is the answer to all the problems. So he actually went uh, to Russia to help. And he was like really talented engineer. And when I read the description of this book, I was really skeptical uh, because it was almost sounding like cheesy because he, one of the reasons he went, uh, he saw the movie in, in Hollywood. He was in California. And it was some uh, Soviet actress that he fell in love with. So he wanted to go to Russia, to Moscow, meet her. So it's, I was like, okay, this is cheesy. But then when I started reading, the most amazing part, of course, then he got disappointed and he left. Uh, but the most amazing part that he really, like he one of those nerds that always count everything and always been skeptical about propaganda. So anything that propaganda says numbers, he just like wants to double check. Like there was a big parade and all the Soviet newspapers, they announced that a million people marched across, you know, uh, Red Square for the May 1st parade, like 1932 or 33. And this guy was there at the parade. 
and he was bored. So he actually was counting rows of people going through. And he's like, there's no way. Uh, according to my calculations, 400,000, that's the max what I counted on the parade. And then a lot of his Soviet friends got butthurt. You know, like, you don't understand, you know, 400,000, it's almost a million. It should sound, you know, good, blah, blah, blah. But also he really didn't like, got skeptical because he was in planning. You know, we have another book. So basically, there's two books that you need to read Behind the Urals by John Scott. So this is a guy who actually was a construction worker building a, a Russia's city of steel. So in Magnitka, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with Gary, Indiana, it has a huge steel mill. Well, Magnitka is a copy of Gary, Indiana steel mill, which is even bigger. So Americans built that, and he was one of the guys who was actually a construction worker. So this is the view of the Stalin um, industrialization, militarization from the worker perspective. And this is from engineer who was in planning in Moscow. So he spent like three months or four months going through all these numbers that the, uh, they were presenting because they were saying how you know, huge development was going on first five-year plan, second five-year plan, and he ran the numbers. He figured out where everywhere when the numbers were um, fudged, and he came up to understanding that Soviet Union in five years barely achieved uh, industrial production what United States achieved in one year during depression. So Great Depression economy of America was equal five years of insane growth of Soviet Union. So basically he proved that all that was just propaganda was no, not even close. So that book blew my mind from that part. I'm planning to make a video just for that part, but this book is really uh, impressed me a lot. And it's his personal account. And then they verified that he met that girl, actually, the actress. They, he tried to marry her and take her to America and it didn't work out. In another book, speaking of World War II or Great Patriotic War, I need to read again, but this is a Zhukov's Greatest Defeat by uh, David Glantz. This is another really good book. Because, yeah, there was a, his Soviet history books, Marshal Pabiede, you know, the general the victory general but all right so yeah okay we got five more minutes and i'll be wrapping up because i'm losing my voice <clears throat> the question is all his calculations fully backed by others well he worked with actual numbers in moscow because he was plan of uh, as a part of uh goes plan so that's a state planning uh organization i don't know if there's those uh, documents available now but he worked at that time so also we have a donation from chuck and those uh, semi vodka and salo i don't think i have any salo. i do i do have some salo in the freezer so good morning hope the war will end soon it's crazy to see two former allies at war well ukraine and if you talk about Ukraine and Russia, we weren't really allies. I mean, uh, back in 1922, Soviet Russia occupied Ukraine because we had Ukrainian People Republic. Uh, but uh, yeah, we were part of the Soviet Union. But to see kind of like uh, neighboring nations fighting each other, like this is, a, yeah, I couldn't believe it. I mean, now it's basically new normal. But unfortunately, it is what it is. So, let's see what else I got. Some of your questions. Okay, we got some of our. We got come I started watch your old older videos. Thanks for your work. You're welcome. So there's the comment why my YouTube doesn't promote my videos. I have no idea. Last February, this is when I first time I realized how much potential YouTube has if he starts. I mean, or your channel can have if YouTube starts promoting your video because it was literally. It skyrocketed in, in one month. I got like 30,000 subscribers. It was views went like this, everything, and then it just collapsed and it went flat again. So 
I mean, there's plenty of topics, plenty of videos, and I see people not just watching one video, you know, it looks like the one video goes viral. The whole channel went viral, and then the whole channel died. <clears throat> so it's crazy. So I have a question. Do you think it would be possible to visit Russia to do research into the creative arts of the Soviet era? Or are all the Soviet people ill-advised to go there now? Yeah, right now, during the war, I wouldn't go at all. Because if you see, they're just uh, trying to snatch any American citizen and then try to trade them for whatever Russian spies get caught uh, overseas. So I, right now, I, I wouldn't recommend. Uh, you probably can do research online. There's a ways to find people in, in Russia that you can maybe, they can help you with research and stuff like that so you know you can search ebay or etsy there's plenty of items for sale so yeah it's possible to do fortunately online but yeah i wouldn't go right now oh no it's a bad idea because they will find a way reason to arrest you and then try to trade you i don't know how many more spies uh, uh spies yeah spies that's sitting there